Dear friends, grace and peace, undeserved forever to you, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We heard about this in Advent, but now we hear it again that John was out by the River Jordan calling the people to be baptized as a sign of repentance, as a sign of turning from their own way, as Luther talked about turning from inward, going inward all for myself, to turning outward for others. As John knew well, though, that Jesus didn't need the product that he was offering because Jesus was following in the way of God. Jesus was following in the, the path of God. Jesus was not in need of turning from the path he was following, which was of God. He was not in need of a baptism of repentance. Because Jesus was a righteous man, he said, I need to be baptized by you. And what's going on here? You're coming to me to be baptized? This should be the other way around. I need what you have. But Jesus said that he did need forgiveness. Jesus said he needed sin. Not his, but ours. That this would then fulfill the righteousness of God. Jesus said, let it be so, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus came to be baptized, not that he needed a baptism of repentance, nor that he had any sin of his own, but rather that he might take our sin upon himself, and therefore fulfilling all righteousness, carrying the sin of the world. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, who takes upon himself the sin of the world, we sing it and say it every Sunday. And it was through this act in baptism that he was showing that he was exactly like us, that he would have a birth, he would have a death, and he would have sin just like us, our sin. And so Jesus drops to his knees in the water and was baptized by John, and a voice from heaven spoke out, and God declared, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased, even with all the sin of the world upon him. This is God saying, I've given him to you so that he can take that which separates you and me from God and take it upon himself. And so the son who is doing the work of God, and God needs this sin too to fulfill all righteousness, to bring back, to order that which was originally created. The Spirit of God descended upon Jesus and God's announcement encouraged, supported, let Jesus continue on to bear this, the sin of the world, all the hate of the world that would come upon him. And it is, this has been God's plan from the very beginning. And as we heard Darlene reading from the first lesson in Isaiah, he said, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one. And now here in Isaiah, he's speaking of this anointed one, the one as oil poured over his head to become the king, that this king will be my chosen one and I will take delight in him. And this one, when you get back to out of, out of bondage in Babylon and back into your own country, this new king will set the example. I put my spirit upon this new king and he will bring forth justice, righteousness for all the nations to see. God spoke this promise to Israel 500 years before Jesus. 
And he spoke it when they were far away from the Jordan River in captivity in modern day Iraq. And God's the Spirit descended upon them and gave them this promise, gave them this long range strategy for fulfilling the righteousness of God for the world. Now, they did get back into their own land. Cyrus, king of Persia, had conquered the Babylonians, and he said, I'll let you go back, but I'm still going to be in charge and in control over you, and you're still going to pay me the taxes. And they did have another king who was also under the control of King Cyrus, but there was never a king like that King David. Now, David was far from pure, but he did defend the poor and the sick and the needy and the widow and the orphan and all of those who were being trampled upon. This is the righteousness of God. Or to use the Latin word, the same word is justice. The righteousness of justice or the just righteousness. They hadn't had a king like King David before the Babylonian conquest, right around about 500, and they didn't have another one afterwards. But God's promise was still there, that God was working to bring this righteousness, this justice, into the world. And so, in Isaiah, he says that, he says, don't cry out and lift your voice. Don't make a big fuss about it. Don't be running around the streets. God promised that the weak and the poor and the lonely would not be hurt anymore. He says, a bruised reed I will not break, and a dimly burning wick, I'm not going to put it out. I'm not going to allow it to happen. They are going to be lifted up. This just righteousness comes not through their screaming about it or our screaming about it on Twitter or Facebook or anything else. That is not going to bring in this just righteousness. It is not going to care for the poor and the needy. It is going to be the actions of the people of God who have been brought into this kingdom of God's just righteousness to fulfill that for what we heard today and what you have done in caring for the poor and the needy just recently and I'm expecting it's going to continue on in the future because you understand that this is your mission. It is God's mission for us. This just righteousness or righteous justice that God calls for was not fulfilled in the kings of Israel, but was given to the people of Israel. And this, the church being the new Israel, we carry on this mission. But now we're baptized into this mission that we can turn over all that is ours, what we have to God, give to God, is our sin, our selfishness, our fears, our disappointments, and what God has to give to us is this joy, peace, patience, kindness that is then, therefore, this glorious exchange that Martin Luther talks about in that wonderful hymn that he has. What do we have to give to God? We give it to God, and God gives us this joy and peace in return. So now it is Jesus who is the one coming to be anointed to be washed, to be taking on all of our sin, that we can receive all of Christ's blessings. That is for you and for me. It is not only the job description of the King of Kings, of Jesus, yes, that was his, but he turns that same job description over to us. Now, before we baptize anybody, uh, I don't remember when I was.
is baptized, but I know that this happened. It always happens. We make sure that people know what they're getting into before we baptize anybody. And we do it publicly. We ask the baptized, the one to be baptized, or their parents and their godparents, if they're going to come to church to hear the Word of God, because we need to keep hearing it, because we keep going inward instead of going outward. If you need this weekly, daily, are you going to walk the way of repentance, of going for God's just righteousness, or are we going to go for our own selfish ways? So we need to hear that Word of God, and are you going to share in the very body and blood of Jesus that it is going to fill your stomach and your body completely, not just an idea about Jesus, but in your whole life? And then if they say, yes, we're going to do that, we go on and we ask, are you going to fulfill God's righteous judgment, justice? That is, are you going to deny the power of sin, of death, and of the devil? Are you going to take those idols that we all have, you're going to throw them out the window? Okay, when we do that, we come before God, then we're completely godless. We've thrown those, God, those idols out the window. Now we stand godless, and then we ask another question. Okay, you're not going to follow <coughs> sin, death, and the devil. You're going to repent from that, go a different way. What way are you going to go? And people, and people stand up and publicly say, the way I'm going to go is I believe in God the Father who created everything. I believe in Jesus, the one who came and was baptized and wants to give me everything of his righteousness in exchange for my sins. I believe in the Holy Spirit that God is with us in the church and in the world right here and now forever. And you say, good. Okay, then we'll do the baptism. If we don't get, if we get no to any of those, then we say, no, you're not ready yet. And then the Spirit of God descends upon us to follow this job description, which where we promise that we are going to work for justice and peace in all the world. Martin Luther King his whole mission and ministry was formed out of this understanding of God as the suffering servant. This coming from the prophet Isaiah as well, and from Jesus' baptism, where this fulfillment of all righteousness for all people is also given up to us in a new and powerful way. In his book, in Martin Luther King's book, Strength to Love, King spoke of how we respond when those who want to ignore us or persecute us react. And he says, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. Be assured that we will wear you out by our capacity to suffer. One day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves, we shall so appeal to your heart and your conscience that we will win you, the ones persecuting us, in the process. And then ours will be a double victory. Jesus' birth was quite unimpressive behind a hotel in a barn. And his baptism in a, not a significant river, not all that significant at all, other than that's where Jesus was baptized. The river itself is not too impressive. And outwardly, the world didn't see anything special in him. He was born as you and I were born, and his was baptized. 
because he needed our sin to fulfill all righteousness, to bring the world back into this order of grace and peace and mercy. Now, St. Paul explained this thing exactly the same way when he says, He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin, that we might know the righteousness and be the righteousness of God. So it is in our baptism that we are reunited with Christ. He with our sin and we with his righteousness. But this means that we are also baptized into his life of being a suffering servant. Not complaining, not being self-pitying or self-indulgent, but claiming the glory of giving up of ourselves for others. Our strength is to walk in that humble path of service. And in doing so, that is the only way where we will win that double victory, that victory of Christ's righteousness and justice for ourselves. But it will also be a victory for our neighbors, be they friend or foe.